thank uh, Johnson for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, today, uh, we are having uh, a webinar on how I treat uh, frontline multiple myeloma, which will be divided into two parts. Part one, uh, frontline for transplant eligible patients, and part two uh, for transplant ineligible patients. We have two uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, uh, first speaker will be uh, done by Dr. Maria Victoria Matthews, who is a well-known uh, myeloma uh, world figure. She's a consultant physician uh, in the Department of Hematology at uh, the University uh, Hospital of Salamanca, Spain. She's the director of uh, myeloma program and she's the coordinator of uh, uh, all clinical trials in her department. And she's also the coordinators of Myeloma uh, group, uh, Spain uh, uh, group. Uh, Dr. Marius uh, uh, is uh, uh, well known uh, for publishing and for uh, being a primary investigator for many of uh, myeloma studies. And she published uh, more than 100 original papers. So Dr. Maria will, be, uh, will present uh, her first presentation will be over 20 minutes. Then Dr. Uh, the second speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Ihab al Himedi, who is a consultant hematology uh, BMT at the section of adult hematology BMT at the Princess Nora Oncology Center, King Abdulaziz Medical City uh, uh, National Guard in uh, Jeddah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ihab uh, uh, is well known on the national basis uh, uh, and he published uh, uh, more than 30 uh, publications. Uh, Dr. Ihab will present uh, frontline uh, myeloma treatment for transplant eligible patients, again for 20 minutes. Then at the end of the session, we'll have about 15 minutes for uh, question and answer. I uh, hope you uh, very uh, nice um, uh, activity today. And please, Dr. Maria, uh, floor is yours. Maria? Yes, I I think that my presentation is yeah, here. And, yeah. Okay. And uh, first of all, thanks uh, for the kind introduction. Thanks uh, for the organization of these uh, webinars. And uh, thanks also to Janssen for inviting me to this uh, webinar in which, uh, well, I will address uh, the topic of uh, the transplant eligible newly diagnosed myeloma patients in light of us 2020. And in this slide, you can see my conflict of interest. And uh, basically, us 2020 brought us important things about the management of this population. In terms of optimal treatment goals, I think that we can potentially plan a potential cure for newly diagnosed myeloma patients transplant eligible. But in principle, when we have in front of us a newly diagnosed myeloma patient, we have to inform him or her that our objective is going to try to delay the disease progression, to prolong the overall survival, trying to ensure the good quality of life. And in order to achieve these objectives, maximal eradication of the tumor clone is required. And something relevant coming from us 2020 is that the conventional complete response, the typical endpoint is moving towards the undetectable measurable residual disease as the new complete response. This is the Spanish experience utilizing next generation flow before maintenance in a Spanish trial just to distinguish the two different subgroup of patients with different prognosis and patients achieving undetectable measurable residual disease resulted into a significantly longer progression free survival. And similar results have been so far reported by the French group also in a trial conducted in young newly diagnosed myeloma patients, utilizing in this case next generation sequencing sensitivity level 10 to the minor six. And today in 2021, we have to incorporate also the imaging assessments. And as 2020 brought us the role of PET-CT 
in newly diagnosed myeloma patients transplant eligible in order to put in context how when patients achieve complete metabolic response, the outcome was better. And in fact, in the bottom of the slide, you can see a combination of complete metabolic response with undetectable measurable residual disease by flow cytometry for the identification of a subgroup of patients with an excellent outcome. However, it's true that in spite of this double negativity for MRD inside and outside of the bone marrow, some patients finally are progressing or are relapsing. You have to know that there are two important points in which we are investigating in order to improve the measurable residual disease detection. The first one is the sensitivity level. This is a meta-analysis published in 2020. And when we reach a sensitivity level of the 10 to the minus 6, we are going to detect less patients in MRT negative, but the prognostic value is strong. And in fact, the hazard ratio for progression free survival is lower. And the second important point is the role of a sustained minimal residual disease negative. And again, we are going to, to identify a subgroup of patients with an excellent prognosis. And in fact, the hazard ratio for progression free survival in this meta-analysis is lower for this subgroup of patients. So my first message also reinforced that coming from us 2020 is that the new response criteria published by the International Myeloma Working Group in 2016 are valid for I would say that every patient with multiple myeloma, but especially in the newly diagnosed myeloma patients transplant eligible, including the role of sustained and minimal residual disease negative. Once the patient is in front of us, one of the first things we usually do is to evaluate if the patient is or not a transplant eligible. And chronological age should not be any more the factor driving the transplant eligibility. And I think that we incorporate much more the biological age, the performance status, the comorbidities in order to select if the patient is or not transplant eligible. If we consider that our patient is a candidate to receive autologous stem cell transplantation, the European, the American, and I would say that the guidelines in whatever country usually recognize the administration of induction followed by transplant and maybe consolidation as well as maintenance. In terms of induction, it's true that the three drug-based combination at least should be the standard of care. And we are definitely moving towards three drug-based combinations plus the monoclonal antibody anti-CD38. And the reality right now is daratumumab. And in fact, the European guidelines recently published consider as options for induction for this population, VRD, DARA, VTD, VTD, or VCD. VTD has been a classical induction regime. We have utilized it in Europe. And here you can see the excellent outcome reported with VTD in a couple of clinical trials for which the follow-up right now is very long, of approximately 10 years. And approximately 30% of the patients remain alive and progression-free at 10 years, and 50% of the patients alive at 10 years. So VTD has been an optimal induction regime. Bortezomib cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone is also feasible, although from my point of view, I think that is suboptimal. Bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone is definitely becoming a new standard of care. And this is the experience of the Spanish myeloma group with a series of almost 500 patients treated with six induction cycles with RVD, for which you can see how the overall response rate was over 80%, with 33% of patients achieving complete response. And the main difference with VTD, evaluated also by the Spanish myeloma group, is based on the toxicity profile, especially the peripheral neuropathy. VRD followed by transplant and consolidation in the Spanish myeloma group resulted in an undetectable 
measurable residual disease observed in up to 45% of the patients after consolidation. And as I previously showed you, this is going to translate into an excellent outcome for this almost 50% of the patients achieving MRD negativity. But the new standard of care based on the Cassiopeia study is daratumumab plus bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone. And the first part of this phase three randomized study included VTD transplanted VTD consolidation versus data VTD transplanted data VTD consolidation in approximately 1,000 newly diagnosed myeloma patients transplant eligible. The primary endpoint for this first part of the study was stringent complete response after consolidation, but I would like to show you here how response rates improved over time. And at the moment of last follow-up, 54% of the patients receiving data VTD achieved a complete response versus 38% of the patients who received VTD alone. In terms of a minimal residual disease, flow cytometry next generation sequencing showed how approximately 60% of the patients receiving data VTD achieved MRT negative, a proportion of patients significantly higher than that observed with VTD alone. And definitely this translated into a better prognosis, at least in terms of progression free survival post consolidation. This is the progression for survival from the first randomization and on the intent to treat patient population, the addition of data to VTD resulted in a hazard ratio of 0.47. And you can see how curves separated almost since the beginning, observing a significant benefit for the addition of the monoclonal antibody data to Mumaba. And in addition, this benefit was sustained across the different group of patients, including patients with high risk features like ISS3 or high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. Overall survival is not mature yet, and definitely all the curves started to separate, we needed to wait to have a longer follow up. From the safety point of view, it's important to see how the addition of data to Mumaba to VTD did not result basically in a more hematological toxicity, a slightly higher incidence of a neutropenia grade three, four, and a thrombocytopenia, no more peripheral neuropathy, no problem with the peripheral blood stem cell collection, and in terms of infections, really the rate of infections and grade three, four infections was comparable in both arms, and only one-third of patients presented infusion-related reactions of any grade, but definitely with the use of data sub -Q, this infusion-related reaction rate will significantly decrease. All these data supported the publication of the Cassiopeia study in the Lancet approximately one year ago, and the main authorities have recognized data VTD as induction, as consolidation, as a new standard of care in this population. I mentioned to you at the beginning of my presentation the role of the quality of life for these young newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And the Cassiopeia trial evaluated the quality of life and overall there is a trend to a better quality of life for data BTD. But this was more evident, especially after consolidation for the cognitive and emotional functioning, as well as for the pain. And this was evident post-induction, but much more, much more relevant with a statistical significance after consolidation. In addition, in the Cassiopeia study, as this trial was conducted after the publication of the new criteria for the diagnosis of myeloma, approximately 90 patients were included without any crab symptomatology, but based on the presence of any one or more of the biomarkers defining right now the diagnosis of myeloma. And basically, data VTD was always superior to VTD in the slim only subgroup and in the crab subgroup. But when we compare the DVTD and DVTD slim only or crab, it seems that the data VTD in patients 
treated with only any one or more of the biomarkers, the complete response rate, as well as the probability of achieving MRD negative was superior. Anyway, the sample size is rather small. This is the outcome, and definitely the follow-up is very short, only 18 months, and we have to wait in order to see if the early treatment in these patients with only slim criteria without any CRAB could potentially have a better outcome. As I previously told you, after these novel combinations that we can utilize as part of the induction, transplant today is a complementary strategy, improving the quality of the response, and MEL200 continues being the standard conditioning regime. Consolidation basically is similar to the induction with the objective of upgrading the quality of the response. And in terms of maintenance, lenalidomide continues being the standard of care. And abortezomib is added sometimes to lenalidomide, especially in patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. Let me briefly show you some open issues that were addressed at ASA 2020. The first question is if it is possible to reserve autologous stem cell transplantation at RELAX. And this was evaluated by this French study in which almost 800 patients were included, RVD three cycles followed by five RVD consolidation cycles versus transplant and consolidation with two cycles of RVD. This trial was updated. The median follow-up now is approximately 90 months, and the primary endpoint, progression-free survival, showed how transplant in the affluent setting was better and resulted into a longer progression-free survival. However, when overall survival was evaluated, no significant differences were observed between transplant and no transplant. But uh, it's important to remark that uh, approximately 90% of the patients received a transplant at the moment of the relapse, and this can explain the lack of benefit in overall survival. A second study was conducted by the European Myeloma Network, addressing also the role of transplant upfront versus transplant at relapse. And the comparator here was VMP, and the induction regime was CYBOR-D. And this study was also updated at the ASH meeting and confirming the superiority of transplant, not only in terms of progression of survival, but also in terms of overall survival. However, important to remark here that induction was a cyborg D, consolidation instead of transplant was VMP, and another important concept, approximately only one third of the patients in the non-transplant arm received a transplant at the moment of the relapse. And this can potentially explain this difference observed in terms of overall survival. Finally, the fourth study incorporated the carfilzomib as part of the induction, but at the end of the day compared also transplant versus non-transplant. And we can see here how KRD followed by transplant and KRD consolidation resulted in the longest progression free survival because especially approximately 70% of the patients achieved MRD negativity. So the question addressed at ASA 2020, is it possible to reserve a transplant at relapse? I would say that today, I think the answer is no. And transplant in the Afron setting continues being the standard of care. It's true that the lack of benefit in overall survival makes possible to consider some patients' preferences, but I think that the question between transplant at, from transplant at relapse should not be any more addressed. It's definitely better in the Afron setting. And maybe the appropriate question is a transplant, yes or not, and if it is possible to skip autologous stem cell transplantation in some subgroup of patients, maybe at the standard risk and achieving MRT negativity. What is the role of consolidation? This was also addressed by the European Myeloma Network, VRD consolidation versus no consolidation. And consolidation was better 
and resulted into a longer progression of survival, regardless of the consolidation, the first consolidation, VMP or transplant. However, I would like to pay the, your attention to the fact that when we evaluated this fourth plot and we observed how was the benefit of consolidation for patients in a stringent complete response or complete response, the hazard ratio was higher than one. So maybe if after autologous stem cell transplantation, my patient is in complete response, even with MRD negative consolidation would not be necessary. And this has been partially confirmed in this stamina trial in which no consolidation RVD or second transplant were evaluated and no significant differences were so far observed between the three arms, but basically VRD was the most common standard of care in this study. And this is the rationale for my answer to this question. And if we consider that we can upgrade the quality of the response, let's go to consolidation, otherwise go directly to maintenance. Any role for tandem autologous stem cell transplantation? Again, the European Myeloma Network trial addressed this question in 415 patients in which half of them received a single transplant, half of them received tandem autologous stem cell transplantation. Response rates were a bit better for patients receiving tandem autologous stem cell transplantation. And overall, there was a benefit in terms of PFS and OS, but I would like to remark that the main benefit of tandem autologous stem cell transplantation was observed for patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. And a tandem transplant was able to overcome the poor prognosis of the presence of high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. Finally, how are we going to improve this, uh, the outcome of this population and also with the information we receive at us 2020? Novel induction regimes, KERD, maybe, although it has been evaluated in a phase two randomized study, but definitely we are going to incorporate more and more the monoclonal antibody anti-CD38, isatuximab, and or daratumumab. And daratumumab today is a reality, and we have uh, some information coming from RVD plus minus daratumumab. I don't know if we are going to investigate much more on the conditioning regime, but uh, definitely we are going to investigate on maintenance with the new data. This is the Griffin study, the phase two clinical study in which VRD was uh, compared with the data VRD as part of the induction and as part of the consolidation and even maintenance therapy. And you can see here how data VRD was significantly superior to VRD alone with a complete response rate after consolidation, 51%, and the MRD negativity rate in the subgroup of patients achieving complete response was 62%. It's true that no significant differences have been so far reported in terms of PFS and overall survival. But you have to realize that this was a phase two randomized study and the trial was designed in order to detect power and to detect the differences in terms of stringent complete response after consolidation. And the phase three per Zeus study conducted by the European Myeloma Network will confirm the superiority of data VRD versus VRD alone in terms of progression free survival that it is the primary endpoint. As I previously told you, some news about maintenance therapy. The Cassiopeia study is evaluating data monotherapy versus observation. And we don't have any results yet, but a press release announced as a significant benefit in terms of progression for survival for data maintenance versus observation. And the Griffin study at ASH 2020 reported the efficacy of the maintenance for one year with the data to Mumaba lenalidomide versus lenalidomide alone. And the data plus len for one year resulted into a complete response rate of 81.8% versus 60.8% for RVD alone, followed by lenalidomide alone as maintenance. And this translated into approximately 63% of MRD negativity rate with approximately 
40 and 30% of the patients sustained the MRD negativity at six months and at one year, respectively. Carfilzomib is being also evaluated as part of the maintenance in combination with carfilzomib, again in this fourth study. And when we add this protease inhibitor, we are going also to improve the progression free survival. And 46% of the patients were able to convert the MRT positive into negative. In summary, and this is my last slide, don't forget the role of undetectable, measurable residual disease and sustain it over time as an important objective in order to identify a group of patients with an excellent prognosis. And in these transplant eligible, newly diagnosed myeloma patients, I consider that the induction regime as well as consolidation, if appropriate, should be protease inhibitor, imid, plus anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. And we have solid data today coming from Dara to Momaba. Transplant continues being a standard of care and maintenance today. Lenalidomide is the standard of care, but new options are coming. And definitely with all these new strategies, I think that maybe we can offer a potential cure to a subgroup of patients with a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews, for your excellent presentation. We'll leave the questions till uh, after the second part of the uh, activity. So, uh, Dr. Ihab and Hemeni will present now how I treat frontline multiple myeloma transplant in eligible patients in the light of ASHA 2020 update. Dr. Ihab, floor uh, is yours. I would like to thank uh, the SSBMT for the kind invitation. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jensen for the sponsorship. Uh, I'm going to talk about how I treat the fr uh, frontline myeloma transplant ineligible in light of ASH 2020 updates. So I just would like, uh, this, this data you've already seen, uh, this is the IF, IFM 2009, um, which has been updated in this last ASH. And just to focus your minds that we, the, the current therapy that we have, the best uh, outcome we can get is 47.3 months uh, medium progression-free survival. So this is with uh, RVD, three cycles, and followed by autologous transplant and two cycles uh, consolidation. So um, the first uh, abstract that uh, I would like to share with you is the update on the uh, DRD, uh, the Maya trial. Um, so DARA, as you know, it's a human IgG kappa monoclonal antibody that is anti-CD38. And uh, it's been incorporated in, in our current treatments as a standard of care. And this trial is a phase three study that uh, discusses this uh, option of giving DARA with RD. Uh, RD is our standard of care for elderly uh, transplant ineligible patients. And in this trial, uh, patients who are above the age of 60 or 65 and older were included with echo status of zero to two, creatinine clearance of 30 or more. And uh, there are two arms, one is DARA uh, with RD and the second one is RD, uh, followed by maintenance therapy. So uh, there has been many, uh, two analyses of this Maya trial before and both have shown separation of the curve in progression free survival. Um, and also uh, the MRD negativity was uh, increased uh, with time. Uh, the most important thing of this trial, or one of the important uh, goals of this trial, was to measure the progression-free survival too, which means the progression-free survival after the patient relapse, what happens to them? Because there are some concerns that if we give our best therapy at the beginning, uh, what will happen, to, what should I give to our, my patient in, when they relapse? Will they be harmed by uh, having a DRD therapy uh, upfront uh, or, or, or not. So um, the median age of this uh, cohort of patients was 73 uh, years, uh, ranging between 45 to 90. 
43% uh, of patients were above the age of 75, and 14% uh, of patients had high risk cytogenetics. Uh, there were more than 700 patients in, in enrolled in this study, uh, three, more than 350 in each arm. So the characteristics of uh, each uh, arm uh, was equal. There weren't many uh, differences between the two arms, uh, DRD versus RD, as you see here. Uh, so the median duration of uh, study treatment was 42 months for the DRD. So uh, the, the duration of treatment in the DRD arm was 42.8 months, while patients on RD had only 22.6 months. 48% um, of the patients um, receiving the DRD discontinued the medication, while 74% of the patients receiving RD discontinued their medication. So the vast majority of patients receiving uh, RD have discontinued the medication. Why? 24% uh, of the DRD discontinued uh, lenalidomide uh, combined with DARA, uh, but they continued DARA as, as maintenance on its own. Uh, while 23% of the um, RD uh, discontinued because of uh, the progression of their disease. So in the DRD arm, 107 patients died uh, versus 132 in the RD arm. So how, we, how about the efficacy of uh, DRD? Um, uh, there has been assessment at 12, 24, and 36 months. And uh, as you see here, that the uh, median duration of treatment uh, response Uh, was at 48 months, it was uh, not reached. The progression-free survival uh, was uh, not reached at 48 months, while in the RD arm, it was 38 months. So uh, statistically significant difference uh, in the DRD arm compared to the RD arm. I'd like to draw your attention to another um, uh, abstract in the ash, the last ash. Uh, it was from the French group and uh, it was looking at real world data uh, in the uh, patients who are harboring uh, poor risk cytogenetics. Um, so the deletion uh, 17P and 1414, they looked at uh, the outcomes in survival of patients who um, had treatment in the first decade of the 21st century, so between 2001 to 2010, versus those who had received treatment between 2011 to 2019. And uh, unfortunately, in, the, in these two groups, there was no benefit uh, over between the two decades. There was no difference in outcomes. So high-risk patients are a, an unmet need um, uh, in our treatment for myeloma patients. And it's very important to look at how high-risk patients have done in this trial of DRD, the Maya trial. And um, looking at the high-risk uh, group of patients in the Maya trial, the progression-free survival of the uh, DRD arm in the high-risk group was 45 months versus 29 months in the RD arm. And there was a, a movement towards a statistical significance in high-risk patients. So uh, they have done uh, quite well uh, using DRD. And uh, high risk group was uh, defined in this trial as those who have 17P, 1416, and 414. So if you look at subgroup analysis of the progression free survival of uh, uh, the Maya trial, you will see that uh, the vast majority of almost all uh, areas um, have uh, favored the use of DRD versus RD. Uh, especially in high-risk cytogenetic patients. How about response? Uh, overall, overall response rates, uh, you can see here at 28 months, 36 months, and 47.9 months, um, uh, responses are uh, statistically better in the DRD arm, and maybe the uh, stringent uh, CRs are improving with time uh, as we go along. While the RD arm, the uh, stringent CRs are, are equal. So, um, so 
So how about the MRD negativity? Uh, the MRD negativity, as we see here, is improving with time, 24%, uh, 36%, 29%, uh, 31% in the DRDR. And um, uh, this is showing that uh, there is uh, an improved response with time and also uh, sustained MRD negativity, which is defined at six months and 12 months uh, by the IMWG uh, criteria. Uh, so sustained uh, MRD negativity, again, statistically better with uh, DRD versus RD. So uh, what happens um, uh, if patients relapse? Uh, they found that uh, some of these patients received bortuzumab, dexamethasone, some uh, received DRD again, some received RD, some received uh, VCD, some received the VMP after their relapse. And when they looked at uh, the progression-free survival, uh, it's um, a medium follow-up of 47 months. Uh, the RD arm, the DRD arm, there was not reach, the progression-free survival, while the RD arm was 51 months. So there was, again, statistically significant improvement in those patients who received uh, uh, DRD versus those who received RD. And this is the uh, progression-free survival 2, uh, which is the DRD versus RD. And it's showing that you do not harm your patient by giving them the best treatment upfront. Uh, here it's very clear that uh, even in uh, progression-free survival two, uh, which are using treatments after the relapse, the progression-free survival is statistically significantly better with DRD versus RD. Uh, how about toxicity? Um, I usually uh, highlight areas where the grade three and four toxicity is more than 5%, and diarrhea and fatigue um, is two uh, side effects that you can uh, monitor uh, with DRD, but they are not different, much different from RD. These are grade three side effects. Pneumonia is significant, 18 versus 11, so um, slightly more. Uh, hypokalemia and cataracts are almost equal, but they are uh, increased uh, more than 5% in both uh, arms. So uh, the most serious side effect is pneumonia, uh, as I discussed before. Um, the other uh, important fact is how many patients discontinued the treatment. So how toxic is this treatment to, to elderly patients? 11% in the DRD arm and 22% in RD arm discontinued treatments because of side effects. So uh, actually much less in the DRD arm. So in conclusion, uh, the median follow-up of 47.9 months, uh, we have uh, uh, not reached our progression-free survival for the DRD arm. Uh, there is a longer follow-up is needed to find out what, what happens, uh, what, what is the progression-free survival. There is significant benefit in progression-free survival too, uh, favoring DRD arm, and there are no safety concerns uh, in this update. The second uh, abstract, uh, is uh, looking at MRD uh, in uh, uh, the uh, Maya and the Alcyone trials. And um, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight uh, very few points uh, that the MRD negativity is uh, quite uh, significant. And those in CR and MRD negativity, again, significantly better in the DRD arm in the Maya and the Alcyone trials. So showing that the monoclonal antibody inclusion with uh, standard of care myeloma treatments uh, tends to produce a significant uh, MRD negativity and thus uh, progression-free survival. And you can see here the progression-free survival of the DRD arm is uh, statistically significant in both trials, the Maya and the Alcyone. So um, DARA may induce longer periods of MRD negativity and deeper responses. Uh, the second, third abstract is uh, the uh, Tourmaline MM2 trial uh, using oral exazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone in transplant ineligible patients, newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And uh, this trial is an all oral treatment for uh, transplant ineligible patients. Um, 
one arm is IRD using exazomib uh, lenalidomide dexamethasone for 18 cycles uh, versus uh, lenalidomide dexamethasone in the other arm. Um, and you can see that the two groups are equal. Um, unfortunately, this trial did not show uh, statistical significance between the median progression-free survival in the two arms, although it was uh, pointed out that it is not statistically significant, but it's of clinical benefit that the progression-free survival of 35.3 months versus 21.8 months in the lenalidomide arm. Uh, there has been some benefit towards uh, exazomib lenalidomide uh, treatment, uh, uh, especially in the high risk, expanded high risk group. Uh, but apart from that, uh, you can see that the lines are crossing the uh, one mark. Uh, the CR and CR, uh, stringent CR rates are, um, are better in the exazomib uh, lenalidomide arm. Uh, however, again, uh, no statistical significant difference. Overall survival, again, um, is not reached. The median overall survival not reached, uh, and it's not statistically significant between the two groups. Side effects is a well-tolerated treatment with uh, minimal side effects. Um, if we point out the major uh, grade three and four side effects are diarrhea, rash, uh, cardiac arrhythmia, and pneumonia. So in conclusion, uh, there is a clinically meaningful progression-free survival benefit, but there is no statistically significant benefit using exazomib lenalidomide dex uh, in the uh, transplant in eligible uh, patients. Uh, finally, um, how do we define uh, in this group of patients um, what is um, transplant eligible and what is transplant ineligible? This is a Mayo Clinic data that was published uh, as an abstract form in the last ASH. In those patients who are age 75 or more, and um, um, some centers use uh, age cutoff. Uh, some centers use clinical judgment to say, see who, which patients are eligible for transplants. Uh, some patients use frailty scores. And in this uh, abstract, they're trying to address that there is a group of patients who are 75 or more who uh, could be transplanted. And um, uh, it's a res retrospective analysis uh, in the uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, Rochester and Minnesota. And uh, at, at their center, they would uh, usually do their transplant as an outpatient, even in this age group. Uh, so the data range between 2005 and 2020, 46 patients uh, data collected. They were 75 years of age and older, and uh, they had comorbidity index ranging between zero and six. We had eight patients with a comorbidity index of five to six. 46% of patients completed the autologous transplant without requiring hospitalization. Uh, reason for hospitalization were fever, infection, cardiac arrhythmia, and dehydration. Overall response rates was 100%, complete responses in 57% of patients, 16 patients achieving MRD negativity and stringent CR. The overall uh, survival was 82 months. Uh, Progression-free survival for the cohort was 33 months. One patient died at, uh, within 100 days, and that was 2%. Uh, of the total population. You can see here, the only thing I would like to, uh, this is the induction treatments the patients received. Uh, and I would like just to highlight that some patients of this age group actually received melphalan of 200 milligrams per meter square during their transplant. And one patient received carfilzomib and melphalan for the transplant. Um, maintenance, uh, the Mayo group, uh, they do not uh, uh, play, they, they, they are very firm. Uh, they used even K KRD in this group of patients as maintenance in some one patient. Uh, apheresis and collection uh, was uh, comparable to normal um, transplant in patients with uh, lesser age. And they did not find any, by using a univariable uh, Cox reg uh, regression model, they did not find any variable that would differentiate uh, the overall survival and progression-free survival. And uh, my conclusion is that autologous transplant is efficacious and can be safely delivered in patient, as an outpatient setting in carefully screened 75 year olds or above. Um, the arbitrary cutoff for age should not be used to exclude patients from autologous transplant, rather careful assessment of physiological age. 
So finally, uh, in transplant ineligible, the guidelines, the MSMART are using um, uh, DRD or VRD uh, as, uh, as first line therapy. Uh, the International Myeloma Working Group, again, VRD or DRD is used. Uh, the NCCN guidelines, their uh, third regimens are uh, VRD, DARA, lenalidomide, lenalidomide, uh, or VCD. And the ISMO guidelines have been recently updated as uh, saying that um, DARA, uh, DRD, and D DARA VMP would be preferred agents uh, for use. Uh, in transplant ineligible patients, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ehab, for your uh, excellent presentation. And now we'll go for the, the questions. So, uh, waiting for uh, more questions, I could ask uh, Dr. Maria, uh, when do you think that uh, uh, MRD measurements and MRD-based uh, treatment decision will be a part of routine? Uh, clinical practice outside the clinical trial? Well, it depends. I would say that if MRD is available right now, you can uh, consider the results in order to take some uh, modifications in the therapy. And uh, for example, today we know that a minimal residual disease and negativity is able to overcome the poor prognosis of the presence of high risk features. For example, in patients with high risk cytogenetic abnormalities, I would recommend you in routine to try your patients to achieve MRD negative. And if, for example, after autologous stem cell transplantation, the patient is not in MRD negative, I would recommend you to give a consolidation. And sometimes if it would be possible to change the consolidation with respect to the schedule utilized as part of the induction, and no proceeding to maintenance before the patient is in MRD negative. This is a practical recommendation. I think that in the future, well, there are some clinical studies, for example, in which the MRD status is going to drive the optimal duration of maintenance. And I think that this will be very useful because right now we are planning maintenance therapy until progressive disease to everybody. And maybe we are over treating some patients Maybe in the clinical trials, we can assume that uh, sustained MRD negativity, for example, for two years will be an optimal endpoint. And when this uh, has been achieved, maybe we can discontinue the maintenance therapy. But of course, this is not uh, something that we can do right now about the maintenance because we don't have solid data yet. But uh, definitely I think that in the future, MRD will help us uh, even to consider the possibility of transplant. Because if we give it to a standard risk patient, optimal induction and the MRD is negative, maybe we can potentially skip a transplant and go directly to maintenance therapy. So many possibilities. So uh, in clinical practice, like in a high risk patient, now you will do all the modalities, PET scan, NGS and flow cytometry. Uh, yes, in routine, we do PET, CT, and a flow cytometry. And in clinical research, we add the next generation sequencing. But in routine, we use only next generation flow, basically because, uh, well, the results are available in 24, 48 hours. And if we have to do some modifications in the therapy based on the MRT information, next generation sequencing will take some weeks or months before having the results. Good. So uh, we have a question. Do you think that CAR T will replace transplant in the future? Maybe. I think that uh, CAR T is uh, targeting BCMA right now at the late advanced stage of the disease uh, are resulting in optimal responses, uh, overall response rate and complete response rate and um, presented for the population included in these uh, clinical studies. Uh, definitely BCMA CAR T's are moving everywhere on and uh, we are investigating with the BCMA CAR T's in some patients in the afron setting. Today, only high risk patients, but if the results are positive, why not to try to challenge the autologous stencil transplantation? 
and maybe patients can start with an induction with the RVD plus anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies and to collect the lymphocytes after a couple of cycles during the manufacturing processes, a patient can receive two additional cycles of induction followed by the CAR-T. But definitely, I think that in the afro setting, CAR-T can contribute to create a curative platform for myeloma and maybe after the CAR-T, maintenance therapy with something would be necessary in order to maintain the response achieved. Because from my point of view, this is the main problem we have right now with CAR-T, the durability of the response. Good. Uh, uh, any update regarding the checkpoint inhibitors in front line of uh, no update because you know that the trials were put on hold and it was not possible to continue with them. This was very unfortunate because maybe with longer follow-up results it could be positive for some patients. But personally, I consider that the checkpoint inhibitors will be recaptured again in order to be utilized as complement of the third therapy because we know that the PD-1, PDL1 pathway is involved in one of the potential mechanism of resistance to CAR T's. So why not to utilize in this context? But there is a question about high risk patients. Uh, is there, do you think that consider quadruple, uh, quadruplet uh, like Dara VRD for high risk patients in your practice nowadays? Uh, sure, it is possible, but uh, we have to know that the high-risk uh, subgroup of patients continue being a challenging subgroup of patients, and uh, the addition of daratumumab to RVD definitely is going to improve the outcome, but it is not going to overcome completely the poor prognosis. So data VRD excellent because more patients are going to achieve MRD negativity. That should be our goal, but we have to complement this with tandem autologous stem cell transplantation if feasible and continuous therapy, maybe not only with immunomodulatory drug, but adding at least the protease inhibitor because I think that the problem for high risk group of patients is not the responses because patients usually respond very well but the durability of the response is usually shorter than expected. Uh, another question, do you uh, see delay of autotransplant in view of results of Dara VTG up front? Uh, no, I would not delay transplant that relapse. I think that if the patient is transplant eligible, it is better to do it in the upfront setting. The exception would be patients' preferences, but I would prefer to incorporate the transplant today as part of the first line of therapy, as complement strategy. Good. Dr. Ehab, there is a question. Uh, how would you manage a very challenging situation, which is extramedullary myeloma with CNS involvement? Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wow, extramedullary and um, CNS. Yeah, CNS. Yeah. That's a very challenging situation. Uh, extramedullary on its own is a very challenging situation. Uh, but we know that chemotherapy in, in extramedullary disease is the way to go. Um, but we know that prognosis is very poor. Uh, so our um, usual treatment is... Uh, uh, VDD pace. Um, the CNS, um, I don't think of the v VDD pace has got any treatment that will penetrate the CNS. So uh, probably uh, I would go with radiation uh, to the CNS if uh, there is myeloma in the CNS. I can't think of any other option uh, that would work for myeloma in the CNS. Anything to add, Dr. Maria, on this? Uh, no, I agree that the prognosis is uh, very poor. We know that the survival for patients with CNS involvement is not superior to seven, eight months. And uh, I would recommend to utilize radiotherapy if possible, although we have to take care about the toxicity. And uh, 
systemic therapy, basically including conventional chemotherapy. And just to note that it has been observed how immunomodulatory drugs, thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide could cross the barrier, uh, the CNS barrier. So I would recommend you to incorporate the imits to these patients. Good. Another question is about CD, anti CD38. Uh, since there is a recent data on uh, acetoximab, uh, would be they are the same or different, or is there any data? Well, honestly, both? Are, both are monoclonal antibodies targeting CD38, although the epitopes are completely different. And the mechanism of action is quite similar, but not exactly identical. And for example, Daratumumab, I would remark the complement dependent cytotoxicity, as well as the phagocytosis and the cytotoxicity mediated by NK cells and the direct apoptosis without cross-linking. Whilst uh, Isatuximab, the complement dependent cytotoxicity is not so evident, and the direct apoptosis through the inhibition of the ectoenzyme CD38 is maybe the most relevant mechanism of action. Immunomodulatory properties are observed in both of them. And honestly, I consider that both are comparable in terms of efficacy and even in terms of a safety profile. The main difference right now is that Isatuximab has to be delivered in IV administration every other week while the data to Mumab can be delivered just once per month since the cycle number seven in a sub-Q formulation. And definitely this is a main advantage, especially for patients. Good. So uh, I don't see uh, more uh, questions. And uh, so in that case, I would like to thank you, Dr. Uh, Matthews and Dr. Uh, you, Dr. Ehab, for your uh, nice presentation. Thank you for our uh, audience. Thank you for our sponsors and for uh, uh, SSBMT. And I would like to uh, announce for uh, next Saturday uh, SSBMT webinar, which will be again for myeloma. What is the latest in multiple myeloma by Dr. Uh, Saad Osmani. So uh, until uh, next week, uh, Hope you uh, good weekend and uh, uh, we'll see you inshallah in one week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. See you next Have time. a nice evening. Thank you. Same to you.